What's up, everybody? Uh, this is Chris Broussard from Fox Sports. And like all of you, I'm sure, I just got done watching The Last Dance on ESPN, the first two parts of the 10-part documentary series on Michael Jordan's last season with the Chicago Bulls. And first, let me say, uh, I thought it was tremendous so far. Uh, I love the way they went back in time and explained where Michael Jordan's competitiveness came from, gave the backstories on Scottie Pippen and uh, Jerry Krause. And it, it was just, it was really well done. And uh, I tr thoroughly enjoyed it. And so what I'm going to do over these next, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, is just kind of share some of my thoughts and my initial reactions as I watched the documentary. Obviously, this brought back tremendous memories for me. Uh, I began covering the NBA. My first season was the 1995-96 season. I was the beat writer for the Akron Beacon Journal covering the Cleveland Cavaliers. And that, of course, was the first year of Michael Jordan's uh, second three-peat. So uh, I covered all the NBA during those three years of, of this uh, three-peat they had. So the first thing I want to say, and, and I'll start off being nice, uh, because you do have to give Jerry Krause credit for the way he built the Chicago Bulls around Michael Jordan. Uh, he didn't draft Michael Jordan. You give Rod Thorne the credit for that. Obviously, he fell into their lap as the third pick. Uh, let me say this quickly. Um, this is a lesson, uh, yet another lesson, that you always draft the best player, not by, don't go by position, go by who is the best player on the board. We saw Michael Jordan go third. I, it's hard to argue, even though he obviously is better than Hakeem Olajuwon, but Olajuwon got the Rockets two championships um, so, you know, it paid dividends in that regard, but the second pick Portland went with Sam Bowie because they had Clyde Drexler as their swing man, which is essentially the same position Michael Jordan was. And look, Clyde Drexler is an all time great. He's a hall of famer. Uh, he's one of the best small forwards to ever play the game. And so you can understand why they said it. Logically, you would say we've got Drexler, who might be as good as Jordan, if not better. And so why do we, you know, let's go for a big man. At that time in the NBA, you needed big men to win championships. And so uh, logically it made sense. But in hindsight, for those of you future GMs out there, we can say, look, they would have been better off taking Michael Jordan. First of all, Clyde Drexler told me, and this was just a few years ago, I talked with Clyde Drexler, and he said he was telling Portland to draft Michael Jordan. Even though we're similar as far as our positions, draft Michael Jordan, we can play together. And they could have played together. Drexler individually was better than Scottie Pippen, individually. And so Drexler and Jordan could have been the Jordan and Pippen duo. So uh, the bottom line, again, draft the best player. And I'm learning as well. I've learned this years ago, but that's one example. I also remember when the Miami Heat, Pat Riley did the right thing when he drafted Dwayne Wade in 2003, I believe with the fifth pick. And they already had Eddie Jones as their starting two guard, who was an all-star starting two guard. And I said, why are they drafting Dwayne Wade when they have Eddie Jones? They have needs elsewhere. But Pat Riley did the right thing, drafted the best player regardless of position. And the rest is history, of course, with Dwayne Wade, leading them to one championship and being the second best player on two championships, of course, with LeBron James. So, that's just an aside. All right, let me get back to Jerry Krause. I'm going to be nice first. As I said, he did a good job in building the team around Jordan. He went out and discovered Scottie Pippen. Now, again, obviously they had to move up to get him. So other teams were beginning to be aware of Pippen and uh, knew he was a good player. 
But to draft a kid out of Central Arkansas, an NAIA school, that takes some guts. And so I do have to give Jerry Krause credit for that. You know, obviously he swung the trade with Seattle for Old Polonies and went ahead and got Scottie Pippen to team up with Jordan. Great move there. Also getting Horace Grant, who was a, a very good power forward on those, those championship teams in the first go round. Uh, so credit for that. And then trading Charles Oakley, who was a Jordan favorite and obviously became a, a, a good player in his own right. But getting Bill Cartwright for him was the right thing to do. Cartwright, a very good center for the Bulls and for Jordan. And so uh, I give Jerry Krause the credit uh, that he deserves for helping to build that team. That said, what he did to break up the Chicago Bulls prematurely. Now, maybe they would not have been able to win their fourth straight championship, but you do not break up a championship team that is, Jordan said it best after they won their fifth. He said, we deserve the opportunity to defend what we have built. Don't let the front office break up a championship team. Let somebody beat us on the court. I couldn't agree more. Breaking up that team is the unpardonable sin in sports. That's unpardonable. You are not a general manager to have fun playing fantasy, basketball, football, baseball, whatever. Your job is twofold, to win championships and secondly, to make the franchise money. That was happening when they were, had that team together. So for Jerry Krause to be upset that he wasn't getting enough credit, to be bothered by the slights that he felt Jordan and other players or even Phil Jackson put his way, that is irrelevant. The nature of your job is to be behind the scenes. You're not, I mean, if you get credit, great. But that's not what it's about. Jordan, Pippen, Phil Jackson, Rodman, Winnington, all, they get the credit. And if you can't understand that, then go do something else. You not only robbed Michael Jordan, the greatest player of all time, of a chance to defend his title for the third time or seventh time, however you want to look at it. You robbed Scottie Pippen of that. You robbed the rest of the players. You robbed Phil Jackson. And you robbed basketball and all of its fans. My gosh, it would have been great to see if the Bulls could beat Duncan and David Robinson, which would have been the matchup in 99 had the Bulls gotten there. So that is terrible, and I can't speak against it enough. And um, it, it's just horrible. Michael Jordan said it. The, the Chicago Cubs spent 42 years, which I think was even an understatement, rebuilding. You don't know if you're ever going to be able to rebuild a championship team. So that is horrible. And um, Jerry Krause deserves the criticism that he's going to get for that. To tell Phil Jackson, you can go 82 and 0 and still not come back as a coach. What is that about? That is not, you want to, you're mad at Jordan for having an ego and Pippen for having an ego and Phil Jackson for having an ego. What is that? That's nothing but ego. Saying if he goes 82 and 0, he won't be the coach again. So when, and I, look, let me say this from the get go. I don't want that for me, at least, I know we're going to do the inevitable and compare Jordan to the players of the day, most notably LeBron James. They are the two greatest players we've ever seen. But I don't want this just to be every little thing has to be compared to LeBron and all that. But what I will say is when you see something like this in the front office 
a front office prematurely breaking up a championship team. It should give you as fans an appreciation for what LeBron James has done. I know a lot of people out there criticize LeBron for his in initiating the era of player empowerment by taking his destiny into his own hands so he could not get screwed like Jordan and Pippen and Phil Jackson did. He has said if the front office can do that, ownership can do that, then I'm taking my future into my own hands. I will never get screwed like that. So I give credit to LeBron for doing that, and it's worked for him. He's got three championships, and all three of those teams he helped orchestrate. He helped orchestrate all of them. He helped get, let's face it, Anthony Davis wouldn't be with the Lakers if it wasn't for LeBron. And LeBron taking on power as a player. <laughs> so you, all of you who've been killing LeBron for building his team and, you know, not playing nice with the front office and ownership and all that, you ought to change your tune after seeing this. That's number one. I'm just getting started. I got notes galore. All right, let's see what else. Uh, MJ, yes. I like when they went back to North Carolina. Well, let me, let me go back even further than that because this became evident with two of the guys. One, of course, Michael Jordan cut from, his soft, cut from the varsity team as a sophomore. Now, some people don't understand what that's saying. That is not saying he was cut from the school's team like he couldn't play. He played JV. All right, it wasn't like he just was couldn't play that, that year. But he didn't make the varsity team, which really isn't a lot of shame as a sophomore, but still, he was obviously competitive. And then Scottie Pippen, who went to an NAIA school, Central Arkansas, as the equipment manager. <laughs> That shows you guys. Now, I'm, I'm always telling youngsters, no matter how good you are, don't count on making the NBA, the NFL, whatever. Always focus on your books. And, you know, no matter how good you are, you can never count on making the pros. An injury could occur or whatever. And, but I, I will say this. This shows you that there is such a thing. So many of the greats are late bloomers. Dwayne Wade was a late bloomer. I mentioned him earlier. And Michael Jordan, you know, was somewhat of a late bloomer. Scottie Pippen, obviously a late bloomer. It goes to show you, now, genetics has something to do with it. Jordan grew from 5'11 to 6'3", 6'4", his junior year in high school. Pippen grew from 6'1 to 6 six his second year of college so there there that has something to do with it and obviously they also have physical talent but it shows hard work it shows what hard work can do now maybe if you work y'all you players out there if you work as hard as possible on your game then you can reach your full potential your full potential might not be the nba it might not even be Division I, but you can maximize whatever ability you have in you. So that's another thing. But let me say this about Jordan. When he was, they talked about him at North Carolina and how Dean Smith, obviously the legendary coach, ran a tight ship and taught Jordan the fundamentals. Remember, at North Carolina, I don't think Jordan ever averaged more than 21 points a game. Uh, he was taught the fundamentals. He was taught how to play within a team system. And one thing that is lost, and I actually think hurt basketball for a couple decades, <laughs> one thing that was lost in the greatness of Michael Jordan, everybody loving his dunks, everybody loving his moves, everybody loving his grace, his athleticism, his isolation game ability, people began to think it was just his athleticism. The reason Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time 
is because he had the ultimate athleticism with the ultimate fundamentals and understanding of how to play the game, how to fit into a team system. That is why Michael Jordan became the GOAT. It wasn't just the athleticism. And I think after Jordan, you know, became what he did toward the end of his career and, and after that for maybe 10 years, 15 years, even people at the highest levels of basketball began to focus more on athleticism, how high you can jump, how fast you can run, how quick you are, and not the fundamentals. And so you had players getting drafted very highly who were just athletic but weren't skilled. And they didn't, they fizzled out and didn't do well in the NBA. And so that is something that I think hurt the game of basketball. And it has been brought back to understanding now with Steph Curry, James Harden, understanding the importance of the fundamentals. It's a game of skills. You need athleticism to a certain degree but it's a game of skills. And Michael Jordan became so great because he had the fundamentals of the game down past. So all you high flyers, all you athletic guys, combine that with the fundamentals and you can go far. I want to talk about Michael Jordan as a freshman hitting that game-winning shot with North Carolina. Now we saw that his coach, Dean Smith, said, if you get the shot, take it. But I remember it like it was yesterday. Watching that game, I was in the eighth grade living in upstate New York, Syracuse, New York, and I was sick. I had a cold. I missed school that day, and I'm laying in the bed all day, and I'm watching that game, eating chicken soup and all that stuff. And watching that game, as soon as Michael Jordan took the shot, as soon as he rose up and it was leaving his hand, I didn't, before it went in, I said to myself, a little eighth grader, I said, he is going to be great. Just because he took the shot, just because he had the guts to take it, I didn't, even if he missed it, I said, this guy's going to be great. Because he had James Worthy, who was an All-American. Sam Perkins, who became an All-American. On his team, he was the little freshman. And he had the guts to take the shot. I knew right then and there, Michael Jordan was going to be a great player. I didn't know he'd become what he did, of course. But I knew right then and there that he was going to be an all-time great player. All right. Second, uh, something else I want to say, and he won six championships, we know. One thing I think people need to understand, especially those that want to poo-poo what Michael Jordan did, oh, it was a watered-down era, oh, you know, they, they were no super teams, you know, he's not as good as the players today, you know, he was one of the few athletic freaks back then, now we got a league full of athletic freaks. Look. look it and I've learned this from watching LeBron's career, and LeBron will tell you this. It is so hard to win a championship in the NBA. I mean, some of the absolute greatest players of all time have never been able to win a championship, never been able to lead a team to a championship. LeBron, as I said, second greatest player I've ever seen. Some of you think he's the greatest. He's won three in 16 years. That's how hard it is to do it. Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, they won one. Together. It is hard to win. A, it, Dr. J went to the finals in the NBA three times before he won his first and only NBA championship. Jerry West went seven times before he won his first and only NBA championship. Elgin Baylor, an all-time great, never won it. 
It is hard. I don't, no matter how good you are, it's not just how good you are individually. It's not just your talent. It is difficult mentally and physically. And so for Michael Jordan, why people of my generation are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt he is the GOAT is because it is incredibly difficult to win six championships. Larry Bird never repeated. Tim Duncan never repeated. Magic repeated and Kareem repeated once. Jordan did two three-peats. So as hard as it is to win one championship, it's even harder to repeat, do it back to back. He did three straight twice. So you got to respect that and understand how difficult that is. Now, it's also interesting. Uh, another reason I think Michael Jordan is the GOAT is because he changed conventional wisdom about basketball in two ways. We saw that Walt Clyde Frazier, when Jordan was drafted, Clyde, who's an all-time great point guard himself, he said about Jordan, well, he's not seven feet, so most got, so he's not going to be able to carry a team in the NBA. That was the thinking. That was conventional wisdom back then. You could really could, you couldn't really even hope to win a championship without a great big man leading the way. Rick Barry did it in 1975 with the Golden State Warriors, although he had, I believe, Nate Thurman was on that team. Uh, and the league was broken up. Remember, you had a lot of the best players were in the ABA at that time. Uh, the Seattle Supersonics in, in 1979 with Gus Williams, the Wizard, leading them, Dennis Johnson. They had Jack Sickler, who was a really good center, but they won. But Dr. J, like I said, he couldn't, as a six, seven small forward, couldn't lead a team to a championship. The conventional wisdom was that you needed big men to win championships, certainly to build a dynasty. And, and they never was around a two guard. And so Jordan showed that two guards can lead teams to championships and actually be the building block of a dynasty. And so that was really the he was the forerunner in that regard to what we see today where, you know, guards and, and small forwards are the building blocks around which you build championship teams in many cases. Uh, so that's number one. The second way he defied conventional wisdom was that it was believed that you could not lead the NBA in scoring and win championships. Larry Bird, as great as he was, and he was an all-time great scorer, he never led the league in scoring. Kareem never led the league in scoring those years in L.A. when he won him with Magic. Wilt Chamberlain won two championships. The first one, he averaged 24 points a game, which was his lowest. I think that was his seventh or eighth year. It was the lowest scoring average of his career to that point. The second championship he won, he only averaged 14 points. So it was believed when he was averaging 50 and 44 and 37, it was believed you couldn't win championships and do all that individually. So Jordan came along and led the league in scoring 10 straight years and showed you, you can actually lead the league in scoring and win championships if you're that good. And so that's the second way that Jordan defied conventional wisdom. All right, uh, another, just as a quick one, Michael Jordan, you know, it reminded me of, I, I'm, a, I'm gonna, I hope this isn't too crass for some people. It reminded me of what, uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope, I thankfully have never been in this situation and it will not be God willing in this situation. But it uh, reminded me of what dudes say, you know, 
you better do when you go into jail. If you go to jail, you better find the biggest, baddest brother in there and beat him down. So you don't get abused in that jail. You get everybody's respect. And Michael Jordan said when he went to the Chicago Bulls, his mentality was, I'm going to find the best player on the team, and I'm going to go after him. Not verbally, but with my game. And that's a, it's incredible that he had that mentality as a rookie. Like day one, I'm, I'm here. It's almost like I'm not even looking at them as my teammates. I'm looking at them as the competition. I'm looking at them as something to be conquered. And so I'm going after the biggest, baddest dude, and I'm showing everybody I'm better than him. And so heck of a mentality, uh, I'll say. I'm going to move on now to episode two. Episode two, and I already talked a little bit about Scottie Pippen. That was some of my notes. Uh, let, let me say, and this goes back to being thankful you fans should appreciate what LeBron's done with the player empowerment. The fact that Scottie Pippen was the 122nd paid, highest paid player in the league in 1997 is absolutely criminal. Criminal. You should have ripped the, I don't care what your philosophy is. I know it was, heck, it was saving you money for sure. But this man helped you win five championships. He carried you for a year and a half when Jordan went away to play baseball. He's made your franchise, which was a joke. People might not understand that too. The Chicago Bulls were a mess. They were the freaking Sacramento Kings. They were the uh, Washington Wizards. Not even that, because at least the Wizards back when they were the Bullets had one championship. They were a joke. It was the worst franchise you can think of, that's who they were. When Jerry Reinsdorf bought them. Well, he got him in 85, I believe. Jordan had already just joined the team, so that was hope. But he made Jerry Reinsdorf so much money by turning the Bulls into a flagship franchise of the NBA, and for that time, all of American sports. And you couldn't, and, and Pippen, of course, helped Jordan. And you couldn't break that contract this man was making like a little over $2 million a year, 122nd highest paid player in the league. He's a top 10 player. Shame on you. And again, that's why, I, man, don't be mad at LeBron and Anthony Davis and uh, Kawhi Leonard and all of these players that players who smartly are taking the, their destiny into their own hands. Uh, all right. The 63 point <laughs> blitzkrieg tour de force by Michael Jordan. First of all, this is a little personal thing. You know, this was bringing back so many members. First of all, and I know the song wasn't out yet. So those who don't know the hip hop history, I'm Bad by LL was not out in 1986 when Jordan did that to the Bulls or to the Boston Celtics. But I'm glad they picked the song. It came out a year later, roughly. It's one of the best hip hop songs ever. LL Cool J's I'm Bad. It was the perfect song for that uh, episode <laughs> that Jordan put on. That that just oh, awesome brought back so many memories. Um, but anyway, at that time, LL was the Michael Jordan of hip hop. Uh, I myself, I, I had just visited Oberlin College as a basketball recruit. 
And I came home that I just decided that's where I'm going. I had a great weekend up there. I'm going there. And I came home and I went, I'm saying this lower cause my daughters, and they don't need to hear this. I went to see my girlfriend, my high school girlfriend, and we just chilled. I told her I'm going to Overland. We chilled on her couch all afternoon and watched Michael Jordan drop 63 on one of the greatest teams in history, the 86 Celtics, who beat the Houston Rockets of Ralph Sampson and Hakeem Olajuwon in the finals. Now, you you want to p- dismiss that Rockets team. That Rockets team swept Magic and Kareem and the Lakers in the conference finals in the West. So understand the greatness. And I remember many of you might not have known that Larry Bird said that quote. He said it again, like as an older person, but he said it at the time. He said, I think that was God after the game disguised as Michael Jordan. (laughs) And uh, that was just Jordan. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, The last thing I want to say, and I kind of alluded to it before, but when you saw Magic Johnson and Larry Bird fawning over Michael Jordan. And at that point, they were still the faces of the NBA. Jordan, for all that he was doing, was not yet the face of the NBA. I remember having debates in college with guys about who's better, Jordan or Magic. And I'm arguing Jordan, and they're arguing it's about winning. Magic wins. Magic wins championship. Jordan just putting up all these points and all that. So Jordan was not the face of the NBA at the time. He was becoming one. But you saw Magic Johnson and Larry Bird were saying, like, he's by far the most talented athletic player in the world in the league. It goes back to what I said. Magic and Bird were the best players in the world at that time, you know, as Jordan was coming up. They weren't what we would call by today, you know, what we would view as athletic as far as jumping out the gym, amazing quickness. Obviously, they're great athletes, but but they weren't what we would call athletic. And so uh, it shows you, again, it is a game of skill. Michael Jordan is the greatest because he had the combination of the great athleticism, the great skill. But I'm glad today that guys like a James Harden has shown us it's not just about your athleticism. It's about your skills. Steph Curry has shown us it's about your skills. So all you young kids out there, work on your skills. All right, that's those are my uh, observations for uh, the episodes one and two. Now I'm going to answer a few of your questions. All right. We got Jerry. Here, here's one up here. All right, hold on. Where were you for MJ's last shot in 98? Okay. Uh, In 98, I was, I believe, covering the NBA. Let's see, during 96, 98. I had, that was, uh, that was June of 98. Wow. My daughters had just been born and uh, in May, March of 98. And so I would have been in Cleveland. I, I had covered the Cavaliers. I, ju- I knew at the time I was about to go work at the New York Times uh, in the fall, covering the New Jersey Nets. So I was in Cleveland and uh, probably, I, probably at my dad's house in Cleveland watching the game. I remember better where I was for his last game period. Uh, when he was a Washington Wizard, it was in Philadelphia. I actually covered that game. I, I was writing for the New York Times. I covered Michael Jordan's first game back with the Wizards. It was in Madison Square Garden. He hit the game winner, <laughs> uh, fittingly, right? And then his last game ever as a wizard, I covered in Philadelphia. Uh, So yeah, that's where I was. Good question. 
<laughs> Who's the Jerry Krause in today's sports? Uh, I was trying to think of the NBA and, you know, some one of our researchers brought up the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder for breaking up that the team that had three MVPs, uh, Russell Westbrook, James Harden, and of course, Kevin Durant. And I can't go that far uh, because James Harden now, you can say they didn't, they didn't offer James Harden the ultimate max, the suit, what they could have given him. So they ended up trading him to Houston. Uh, that is somewhat related. That's somewhat relatable to that. But um, you can't blame him. Kevin Durant left on his own, and then they traded Russell Westbrook, which turned out to be a good move for them. So I won't go there. I would say, um, and it's a little different. I'm not going to kill him as much as I killed Krause, but I would say you got to it's, – it's like the Patriots. You know, there's this – some of these front – and, and Belichick's the coach, and I know he's the real one behind it. But some of these guys – have the coaches and and front office people have this lust to once you get so much success it's almost like you become bored with the success i don't think jerry Krause and reinsdorf would have been so ready to rebuild if they didn't have five championships under their belt they were getting bored with it and 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 bill belichick would he be so anxious and eager to get rid of tom brady rather than ride it out as long as you can if he didn't have the six rings. So, I, I you know, look, Brady, it's a little different because Brady's about to be 43 and he's older. But I would say what they should have done in New England, rather than let Tom Brady go, I, say, I said you try to keep him and you should have gone out and gotten like a Stephon Diggs who was available, obviously, in trade or DeAndre Hopkins. Or some, or maybe OBJ. You go out and get a receiver, some talent that you can put with Tom Brady. Now, look, I, I think Kansas City's great, and I don't know that they beat Kansas City, but that's what comes to mind: is this rush, this rush to, you know, move on from a dynasty and rebuild. I give the Spurs credit because they they didn't force the end. They rolled it out with Duncan and Ginobili and. Parker, as long as it, it they could. And um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. All right, fellas. I enjoyed it. And uh, this was fun. I think the, uh, like I said, it was a tremendous episode one and two. And I'm already, I can't wait till episodes three and four next Sunday. So we will do it again next Sunday. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun for me to talk with you. And uh, so tune in again next Sunday uh, on the association on Fox, Fox Sports One. All right, y'all. Peace.